My name is Carmen Mueller Carger. I'm a teaching faculty at Florida International University. In this first video, I am introducing the very fundamental concepts of mechanical vibration. Some of the figures and content are adapted from the textbook Singer S. Raoul Mechanical Vibration for Pearson 6th edition. This is part of the chapter one. The learning objectives of this video are recognize the importance of student vibration, Describe a brief history of mechanical vibration. Understand the definition of vibration. State of the process of modeling a mechanical system to study vibration. Determine the degrees of freedom of a system and identify the different type of vibrations. All systems that have a mass and that can accumulate potential energy are vibrating systems. Therefore, a vibrating system in general includes a means of storing potential energy, that means a spring or elasticity, and a means of storing kinetic energy, mass or inertia, and a means by which energy is gradually lost. We can define vibration as any motion that repeats itself after an interval of time. In one vibrating cycle, this system develops kinetic energy that transforms into potential energy and back into kinetic energy. Some systems have dissipation mechanisms. If we want to talk about the importance of studying mechanical vibration, we have to say that most human activities involve some sort of mechanical vibration. Examples are many. We hear because our eardrums vibrate, and I invite you to watch videos that are available on internet. Sound waves entering the ear travel through the external auditory canal before striking the eardrum and causing it to vibrate. Human speech requires the oscillatory motion of the laryngeal, and I also invite you to watch some videos that are available on the internet. In machines, vibrations can loosen fastness such as knots, and you see in this video, there is high vibrations and this knot will eventually be loose. Periodic forces, like the rotation of the blades in a helicopter, bring dynamic responses that can cause fatigue in the materials. The phenomenon known as resonance leads to excessive deflections and failure. The vibration and noise generated by engines causes annoyance to people and sometimes damage to property. Unbalance in machines can cause problems to machines itself or surrounding machines or environment. We have plenty of more examples. I recommend you to watch the video of the Tacoma Bridge that collapsed in 1940, or laundry machines that walk due to an unbalance, or testing airplane wings. I like to go over very briefly over the mechanical vibration history. People became interested in mechanical vibrations when they created the first musical instrument, as long as 4000 BC. And Pythagoras was considered the first person to investigate musical sounds. Galileo Galilei, back in 16th century, is considered to be the founder of modern experimental science. He conducted experiments on the simple pendulum, describing the dependence of the frequency of vibration and the length of the pendulum. Robert Hooke also conducted experiments to find a relation between the pitch and the frequency of vibration of a string. Joseph Sauber was the first one to coin it the word acoustic for the science of sound. The equations of motion derived by Sir Isaac Newton are very commonly used to derive the equations of motion of a vibrating body. Brooke Taylor was the first one to obtain the natural frequency of vibration observed by Galilei and Mersenne. 
three mathematicians, Bernoulli, D'Alembert, and Euler, were the first ones to introduce partial derivatives in the equations of motion. Fourier contributed on the development of the theory of vibration and led to the possibility of expressing any arbitrary function using the principle of superposition. Joseph Lagrange contributed to the energy methods presented the analytical solution of a vibrating string. Charles Coulomb did both theoretical and experimental studies on torsional oscillations of metal cylinder suspended by a wire. He also contributed in the modeling of dry friction. Schladny was the first one to develop the method of placing sand on a vibrating plate to find its model shapes. Simon Poisson studied vibration on the rectangular flexible membrane. Lord Baron Rayleigh, among other many contributions, he developed the method of finding the fundamental frequency of vibration of a conservative system by making use of the principle of conservation of energy. Of course, all these very renowned scientists contribute in many, many different areas of science and mathematics. Most practical vibrating systems are very complex and sometimes it's impossible to consider all the details for the mechanical and mathematical models and analysis. Along a vibration course, we will model and find the equation of motion of simple mechanical system that will allow us to determine the equivalent constant for the springs and the mass, which represents the elements that accumulate potential and kinetic energy, and we will also find the damping elements that dissipate energy of the system. We will learn how to solve linearized versions of the equation of motion that govern the system, and we will find the analytical solution and analyze the response of the system given either initial conditions or external forces. All mechanical and structural systems can be modeled as mass, spring and damper system. In some systems, such as an automobile or a motorcycle, the mass and the spring and the damper can be identified as a separate component, mass in the form of the body, spring in the form of the suspension, and the damper in form of the shock absorbers. However, there are some cases that the mass, the spring, and the dampers do not appear as a separate component. For example, in the airplane wings, the mass of the wing is distributed along the wing. And also, due to the elasticity, the wing undergoes noticeable deformation during the flight, so the wing is also the spring. In addition, the deflection of the wing introduces damping due to relative motion between the components, such as the joints, connections, and support. So the internal friction due to the microstructural defects of the material also represents the damping. A mechanical model represents all the important components of a system. In this case, the mass, the springs, and the damper. And as well, with the wing, we will represent it as a cantilever beam that we will find an equivalent constant of spring, and then we have the mass. As I said before, we can also introduce the damping due to the internal forces of the wing. Once we have the mechanical model, we can find a mathematical model which represents the equation of motion that governs the system. This represents a second order differential equation. Once we have a mathematical model, we can use either analytical methods or numerical methods to find a solution, and that solution will be, have to be interpreted. For that, we do an analysis, and then we have to compare if that analysis, if that response does actually respond as our real system. If it doesn't, we will have to go back and refine our mechanical model, and we will have a different mathematical model, and therefore a different solution. So anytime that we want to simulate and represent a system with a mechanical model, we may have to go through several iterations. In our system, we have elements that accumulate potential energy and elements that accumulate kinetic energy. 
The elements that accumulate potential energy are, for example, spring and the elevation of a mass. The potential energy of a spring is always positive and is defined as one half the constant of the spring times the stretch. It doesn't matter if it's positive stretch or negative, which is at the compression of the spring. The potential energy of a mass depends on the position respect to a datum. If we place a datum in a particular place, if we go up, we will have a positive potential energy, so the system gains the capacity to do work, and if we, it goes lower that datum, it loses potential energy, therefore it's negative. It loses capacity to do work. Then we have the systems that accumulate kinetic energy. We have systems that are in poor translation, and therefore the kinetic energy is defined as one-half mass velocity of the object square. We have systems that are in poor rotation. For example, this one is rotated respect to point P, and the kinetic energy is defined as one-half mass moment of inertia at P, angular velocity square. Then we have systems that are in general motion. They are in translation and rotation. Therefore, the kinetic energy, when we calculate it using the center of gravity, has two components, the one that represents the translation and the one that represents the rotation. We can calculate the kinetic energy of a body in general motion, but using any other point that has velocity, not necessarily the center of gravity. In this case, we have to include a third term, and the kinetic energy will be defined as the translation, the rotation, and this term that combine both. Then we have the element that dissipate energy. We have the viscous damping, which force is proportional to the velocity. And C represents the constant of the damper, which involves all the characteristics of the damper. We have the dry friction, or Coulomb, and that is a function of the coefficient of friction that describes the contact between the two surfaces and the normal, which represents the weight of the object. And then finally, we have the material or solid or hysteresic damping that represents the friction between the molecules of the material. The concept of degrees of freedom is very important. It represents the minimum number of independent coordinates required to determine completely the position of all parts of a system at any instant of time. We will have systems with only one degree of freedom, which are called single degree of freedom system. Even though you have two variables, those two variables will be related to each other, so you need only a single variable to describe completely the position of all the parts of the system at all instants of time. In this case, we have x, which is the variable or parameter that describes the position of the system. When we have a torsional system, we usually use a angular displacement. Then we have systems with two degrees of freedom for which we need to two parameters to completely describe the position of all parts of the system. If the system is a rotational system, we usually use two rotational displacements. If we have a system where we have a linear displacement and an angular displacement, we can combine using a linear displacement variable and angular displacement variable. This pendulum can, could also be described with the position a linear position, but we usually, for a rotation, we use an angular displacement. In this case, we have a system of three degrees of freedom. We have three different rotations, therefore, we need three angular displacements to describe the position of all parts at, of the system at any instant of time. The terminology of vibration. 
We have the cycle, which is the movement from one position going to another direction and returning to the same position. In this curve, the cycle will be from here all the way to here. We have the amplitude and is the maximum displacement of the vibration body from its equilibrium position. If we measure this curve from the equilibrium position, the amplitude will be from this zero to the maximum. And it's usually called by the letter A. We have the period of oscillation is the time to complete one cycle and is denoted with the letter T. We have frequency of oscillation, which is the number of cycles per unit of time and is defined as one over the period. We have the circular frequency of oscillation, which is the number of cycles per unit of time and is described as two pi over the period or two times times the frequency of oscillation. Fifth vibration is when a system after an initial perturbance is left to vibrate on its own characteristics. No external force acts on the system. The system oscillates at its own natural frequency. That is an example of a pendulum. For the contrary, we have force vibration when a system is subjected to an external force, often repeating type of force, a harmonic force or a periodic force. The oscillation that rises in machines such as diesel engines is an example of force vibration. Here in this figure, we see a force vibration due to the base motion. We will study different responses. For example, we see in this figure damped vibration. We also will study the undamped vibration. Here we see a nonlinear equation that we will learn how to linearize in order to find the analytical solution. There is also deterministic, like this one, responses or random vibrations. In a fundamental course, you usually study only the deterministic excitation and response of a vibrating system. In the next presentations, we will learn more about the process of studying mechanical vibrations. We will learn about mechanical models, mechanical mathematical models, finding the solutions, and the analysis.